what inspired me to run for office in particular was really that oath that I took when I put on the uniform to support and defend the Constitution. For me, it's not about partisanship. It's not about Republican versus Democrat. Um, Welcome, Ms. Hager. It is amazing to have you here with us. This is our first virtual installment of Pizza and Politics. And so unfortunately, there's no pizza here today, but we just wanted to start off and ask, how do you feel about pineapple pizza? I am for it. You know, I know a lot of people have strong opinions, but it's actually a great question to start with because much like politics, we can disagree. It's okay. Put whatever you want on your pizza. You know, um, I think one of the things that I put on pizza about a year ago that changed my life was spicy honey. Um, you know, so savory and sweet just go really well together. So if, if you're ever in DC, go to and pizza and there's some kind of spicy pizza that has like pepperoni and arugula and goat cheese and spicy honey and it is to die for. So I say, you be you, as long as you're not hurting anyone else, put whatever you want on your pizza. Keep that in mind. That is awesome. good. Yeah. Spicy honey sounds really interesting. I'll definitely have to try that place out if I ever find myself in DC. Yep. Um, but just to start off for the first question, can you talk a little bit about what inspired you to get in the field of public service and to run for the Senate? Yeah, I guess public service started when I joined the military. Um, and it started from, I wish I could give you some big inspirational story, but really um, young, not present company excluded, but younger people tend to, because it's our only experience, be thinking about ourselves, you know, and, and as you grow and mature and get older and interact with the world more and maybe have kids, you start to, I don't know, have a deeper understanding and interaction with people. And I, I guess that depends on your experiences. Maybe I just hadn't had experiences by the time I was in college that um, had connected me a lot to people. So from kind of a self-interested place, I wanted to be Han Solo my whole life. Um, and so um, I wanted to fly the Millennium Falcon and, and uh, flying helicopters in a combat environment was the closest thing that I could get to that. So that's what I wanted to do. As I grew a little older and did the mission and interacted with people, um, it, it definitely became about the mission. Um, the rescue mission is these things we do that others may live. I'll never forget this as long as I live. My first real rescue, um, you know, we got the notification over the radio. We, we took off running out to the helicopters. I was actually excited. I was pumped. I was like, whoa, I'm a real rescue pilot. And went off on the mission and picked up an American who had been shot in the arm. And we thought, well, shot in the arm, but the bullet went in, into his chest cavity and we ended up losing him. And to this day, what is that? So 2007 and it's 21. So 14 years later, I still suffer a lot from the guilt of being excited to go do something that ended up resulting in somebody losing their life. So. That was a moment definitely that I grew up, that it became more about the mission. Um, but what inspired me to run for office in particular was really that oath that I took when I put on the uniform to support and defend the constitution. For me, it's not about partisanship. It's not about Republican versus Democrat. Um, I, I, I grew up in very rural Texas in a, in a Republican family, um, but they were fiscally conservative Republicans, not so much social Republicans. Um, and when Frankly, when Donald Trump took office, the things he was doing, not necessarily, I mean, the, the Republican Party and what they've be become, you can probably get away with saying Republicans, but I just don't like generalizations. I think it's divisive. So um, there were definitely were people, Donald Trump included, who I thought represented a threat to the Constitution. And I had taken an oath to support and defend our Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And you know, so I thought that there's a lot of things you can do to impact politics and, and who gets into office. But because I had this story where I was a helicopter pilot, I was shot down, I got um, exfiltrated standing on the skids on the outside of a helicopter. It was like this big Hollywood dramatic story. I couldn't loan that to someone. I couldn't let someone benefit from that. Um, I, I had to do it myself. So I ran for Congress in a district that I did think was winnable. We pulled the margin from 32 to less than three to 2.9. Um, and I think we did a lot of good, frankly. I think that we helped um, gain the majority in the House. Uh, I think that you know the guy I ran against um, used to donate to other candidates and he had to get people to donate to him now. So that helped. Um, and then he went and voted for the Violence Against Women Act, which was something he always stood against. So I do think that we did some good. Um, 
And then what motivated me to run for Senate was, is really, and somewhat for the house, um, having kids, you know, uh, having kids made me want to go out and like bubble tape the whole world, <laughs> and, like protect them from every sharp corner and, uh, climate change and gun violence and, and make sure that they have access to healthcare and all of the things that we want for our kids. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so what would you think is the most rewarding part of public service and vice versa? What would you say is the most challenging? Um, I think the most rewarding part is feeling like, you know, you wake up and your feet hit the floor. I have been in a situation where I've been doing a very noble mission, trying to save people's lives. I've worked in healthcare. I've worked in tech. Um, and, and, and if you can if your feet hit the floor and you feel like I have to get out there, it's a lot easier to motivate yourself to, to overcome challenges and face stress and get through the day. It was harder for me to, I didn't like the feeling of my feet hitting the floor when I was working at Dell. Like I didn't think anyone would notice if I didn't show up. Um, and, and I don't think that these races are about win and lose. They really are about what you accomplish and getting an oar in the water and pulling in that direction. And I do think, um, you know, for example, with the Senate race, I'm, I'm not disappointed that we didn't win. I mean, I, I'm sad for all the good that we could have done in Texas. And I do think we could have gotten people more access to healthcare, which is probably the biggest challenge facing Texas. But the whole idea was to get the majority in the Senate and we got it because of Georgia. So. Um, I also think we helped elect Biden because um, who knows what would have happened if Donald Trump didn't have to come to Texas. He should not have had to come to Texas, but we put up a big fight and he had to come to Texas. He had to spend money here. And, you know, he, he would have gone to Pennsylvania or something had he not had to come to Texas. And so I do think that we helped. Um, and I think that uh, that's been really rewarding is feeling like you're still fighting the good fight. And, and, and as I look into my next steps, I'm looking for that. Like I'm getting offers from places that um, I don't wanna go back to kind of selling my soul to the rat race. I, I do need to feel like when my feet hit the floor, I am making an impact. Um, the hardest thing for me is that I'm super introverted and I'm a very private person. And so um, I've become good at it. I've become good at giving speeches and talking to the media and looking like I'm extroverted, but it's something I, I struggle with every day. Um, on the Myers-Briggs personality test, I am a, um, 26 introvert, which is as high as you can get. And I'm a zero on the extrovert. So um, that's something I've really had to push through. Um, and, you know, there's really crazy people out there and having kids in this environment, running for office to protect my kids, but then putting our family on parade in a way that my kids get recognized. I don't know if y'all noticed, probably not, but in the congressional race, my kids were on everything right? Because they were so damn cute. And so they were on every mailer. And I was like, you know, I'm a mom. Um, I needed to soften myself up a little because I was a combat vet. Um, but in the Senate race, because of lessons I learned in the House race, you can hardly ever see my kids on anything. I think Daniel's face flashes for just an instant on the reintroduction video or no, no, the carpool video where I'm strapping the kids into the helicopter um, for just a second. But like I would be out eating with my family at a restaurant before COVID and I would have people, um, I'll never forget this. Um, the boys were actually out on the playground at the restaurant and I saw an adult cross the playground and approach them. And I was like, what is happening? So I jumped up and I ran over there and, and the person was like, you look like Jude, are you MJ's son? And is, is your mommy here? And I was like, no, like, you, you know, so that really scared me. Um, and so I would say sacrificing your privacy and having people think that they are entitled to every part of you and, and, and every um, aspect of your life has, has been the hardest. Okay, moving on to our next question. Um, for our viewers who aren't familiar, can you talk a little bit about what the campaign process is like and also how, if at all, did it change in the pandemic? Well, it was nothing like I expected. Um, and I was so naive going into this thinking that politics was about the exchange of ideas and discussing policy um, and whose solutions better matched the values of the people who you would be representing. Um, that's not at all what it's about. 
<laughs> unfortunately, it's about marketing and manipulation and money and um, who you know and who can lie more effectively. And I think that's all why I was ultimately not successful. Somebody said to me, you lack the character deficiencies to be successful here. And I was like, well, I'll take that as a compliment. But I mean, they, they were right. You know, um, I don't think that the, the people who voted for my opponent um, really knew where I stood on the issues. You know, um, my opponent said I wanted socialized health care and I wanted to defund the police. And I mean, that's just not who I am. You know, I, I, I want people to have access to Medicare. I would like Medicare to be available for everyone. Um, and I, I've worked with law enforcement for years. Um, you know, they, they need uh, a lot of reform. Um, and I am for supporting police unions that say, hey, we don't want to send our cops out to every single call. We want to be able to have the resources to be able to say, let's send this type of person or that type of person. But that level of nuance never came into it. Um, it's a very um, clickbaity, 30 second talking point, um, who can speak the loudest and whose lie is the most. I don't know if you guys are like super bored and looking for something to watch. If you ever see the debate between me and John Cornyn, um, I was so prepared. I was so prepared. We had done debate prep and debate prep and mock debate and mock debate and mock debate. And the person who played John Cornyn was so good. I was just like, boom, on my game, totally prepared. And then he said, my opponent wants to legalize prostitution. And you can see my face where I'm, I was not prepared for that. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, just blown away at the level of like, pull out of thin air. Okay, well, you're a Nazi. Like what? I mean, <laughs> you know, it just blew me away that he would just make something up like that. Um, so... What, what was your original question? I'm getting off topic. What was the campaign process like? Right. If so it... the campaign process was surreal. And, and I would say, you know, every two years is a cycle. Um, the first six months of that cycle, people are trying to figure out if they're going to run. Um, it's really like an 18 month cycle. Um, it's a year long cycle. If you count the filing date, filing dates are usually in December. So you officially file, but once you announce, you have to start doing FEC reports. And so the campaign starts once you announce, right? Um, and so the primary process was more painful than I expected, especially since I used to be a Republican. So that, that was painful. Um, and I did not like arguing with people who, I, my military background makes me put the mission first. So every time I was arguing with or debating with somebody in the primary, I am cognizant of the fact that I could lose and that person could go against John Cornyn and the mission is to remove John Cornyn. So I never wanted to say something that would hurt their chances of beating John Cornyn because I wanted to accomplish the mission. I didn't have the ego that said it has to be me. You know what I mean? So I don't know, it just wasn't my personality type and my integrity and everything. It's just not suited to politics. But um, I would say the last, depending on what level of office you're talking about, the last like three to six months is field where you're out there really talking to people. The first year or however long you have when you announce is about foundation building. So that is mainly fundraising, um, but also hiring, um, setting the, the foundation, building your team, getting your plan together. Um, don't listen to people who say fundraising isn't important. We're gonna do this grassroots. Grassroots is not code for unsuccessful at fundraising. We were grassroots and I raised 37 million over two, you know, and our average donation was like 20 bucks. You can be grassroots, you should be grassroots, but you need to be successful at fundraising because whoever raises the most money is not guaranteed to win. But I can guarantee if you don't raise money, you won't win. And, and that sucks, but that's the way it is, right? So um, I would say, you know, it was um, disappointing. I wanted it to be inspirational. I wanted there, there to be more town halls. I think if Texas wants to go the way of Georgia, we need to be doing 24 seven, 365 days a year field and not just three to six months before the election. We need to be out talking to people about, like I grew up believing things about Democrats that weren't true because I grew up in a very rural area of Texas 
and Democrat was a four letter word and they were the monsters under my bed. And, <laughs> you know, um, so I think we all grow up with misconceptions about things and um, we need to be having conversations like these all the time, not just three to six months before an election. So. So um, I know you talked a little bit about the misconceptions earlier, but could you expand on like the misconceptions about how politics work? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest problem with politics is money in a couple ways. One is um, the, the money influence on sitting members is so bad. We have to end Citizens United. We have to, you know, stop corporations from being able to run our legislators. Um, and so one of the biggest misconceptions I think is that the people who are in power are somehow the best and brightest of us, all knowing. Um, there's a lot of imposter syndrome when people, especially women think about running for office. There's gotta be somebody better than me, smarter than me that can do this, right? No, there's not. No, it's you. You're the one who should be doing it. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, it, <clears throat> our elected officials, I don't think are a cross section of the best and brightest of us who are fully in charge of their actions and are making their decisions based on their conscience and what's best for their constituents. That's not it. They're largely, some people might be like that, but they're largely um, making decisions to keep their donors happy so that they can be reelected because they want to rise up in the power. They want that next um, committee assignment or they wanna be majority leader or whatever, right? Um, so because of that, we need to end Citizens United. We've gotta get corporate money out of politics. We need campaign finance reform to make our political system more accessible to regular people. One of the biggest problems uh, in the subsection of money being the biggest problem is that to run for this level of office, you have to quit your job. It's a full-time job. So guess what that means for somebody like me, who's a working mom, who is you know just trying to keep a roof over her kid's head. It's nearly impossible. Um, it leads to ultimately these independently wealthy people who can walk away from their, their jobs, mostly lawyers, which I have nothing against lawyers, but we have a, um, an overrepresentation of lawyers, you know, and, and you might think, well, it's a good thing to have lawyers in a position to write laws. Yes and no. We're asking a big group of people to legislate solutions to the challenges facing our countries, our, our, our country and the people in our country. And the vast, vast majority of them have never faced those challenges. So you ask that group of people to prioritize saving social security when 99% of them have never worried about whether or not social security would be there for them. You know, you, you ask that group of people to, to get people access to healthcare, but they've never worried about where they're gonna get their healthcare from. Not all of them, most of them. So I think we need to make our political system more accessible to running for office to people who are not independently wealthy so that we can get pragmatic solutions to these challenges that we're very familiar with, that they're not necessarily familiar with. Um, and we've got to do something about this misconception. That's why I love this question, that the, the people who are there are somehow infallible and they're really smart and, and they must be great to have gotten where they are. A lot of times they've gotten where they are because they have kissed the right ass or went to the right law school or, or uh, raised enough money um, or, or paid for it themselves. Um, and we need to, you know, take the rose colored glasses off and see them as fallible human beings that need to be checked and, and uh, held accountable. Why do you think students should take the time out of their busy schedules to learn about government? Because it's completely up to you guys. And I don't mean that in a metaphor, you know, I'm going to hand you the baton during a relay race. I mean, it is literally up to you guys. Um, I don't have as many years in this country left as you do. Um, no matter what, even the people who are passionate about stopping climate change are not as invested in stopping climate change as you guys should be. Um, every generation we relitigate our civil liberties. Just like every generation, there's a big war, just like if you don't study history, it's bound to repeat. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about civil rights again. We're reliving the civil rights era, you know? So when I fought to open jobs for women in the military, um, we filed a lawsuit, the ACLU 
um, Hagar v. Panetta. We, we filed this lawsuit against the Secretary of Defense to open jobs for women. And then he, three months later, repealed the policy and opened jobs for women. And while we celebrated, we were like, woo, we're popping champagne, literally. Jeff Sessions, the Alabama senator at the time, went on TV and said, we're going to legislate that, that policy back in place. And man, I was like, God, I thought we won. Never think you've won. Never think you've won civil liberties, especially. Because there will always be people waiting in the wings from either end of the political spectrum to take away your civil rights and try to profit off of it, try to exploit you and profit off of it and limit you so that they can exert power over you. And it's going to happen a couple times in y'all's lifetime. And if we don't arm y'all with how to stand up against that and fight those fights, we're, we're doomed. So y'all's generation is actually the most important generation to be getting involved. And when you're in your 20s and 30s, you won't be the most important generation anymore. The 18 and 16 year olds that you're mentoring will be the most important generation. So it's always the young people that are the most important. Absolutely, thank you. And thank you again so much for taking the time to talk with us today. I know you're really busy and I you have something pretty soon. And we really look forward to staying in contact with you and hopefully following future campaigns and your career in public service.